In the last episode, we saw how the Byzantine Empire won the war against the Goths in Italy that lasted as long as the current war against Afghanistan conducted by the US. During that very war, a new strain of barbarians, the Longobards, entered into Italy from the east and established a number of dukedoms in various Italian cities except Rome and except the holdings of the empire on the coast. The Longobards did not have a political organization. Their culture was based on the so-called sagas, and sagas are stories about voyages and battles conducted by the Vikings, their battles and migrations to Iceland. During migrations through Eastern Europe, the Longobards had converted to Christianity, but they were still Arians, that is, followed the followers of the doctrine of Arius, who essentially denied the divinity of Christ and the concept of the Trinity, which is cardinal, which are cardinal to the current Catholic faith. As we saw in the last episode, Alboin became the first king of the Longobards in Italy in 569 AD. Three years later, in 572, Alboin died, victim of a retaliation by his wife Rosmunda. During royal banquets, Alboin forced Rosmunda habitually to drink out of the skull of her father, of her father, massacred during a battle, and she could not take it anymore. After the murder, Rosmunda and her lover conspirator called El Miki repaired to Ravenna, hosted with great honors by Longinus, the legate, or if you like, the viceroy of the Byzantine emperor. Longinus, tempting Rosmunda with the idea of becoming the first lady of Ravenna, convinced her to, to poison El Miki. Realizing that he had been poisoned, El Miki forced Rosmunda to drink the remainder of the poison, and they both died. Meanwhile, the Longobards eliminated of what remained of the Roman administrative institutions that had been maintained, and I said in the previous episode, and revived by the King Theodoric of the, of the Goths. Now, the Longobards set their eyes on Rome. Here, having failed to get assistance from Byzantium, the Pope asked the King of the Franks Childebert the second for help. And this is the first time that we see the Franks appearing in the history of Italy. But the king of the Longobards, named Autari, defeated the Franks and in 590 AD married Theodolinda, a beautiful girl who was Catholic and played an important part in the history of Italy. After Autari died, the Longobards confirmed her as a queen. And later, Theodolinda married Agilulf, Duke of Turin, who extended the possessions of the Longobards throughout Italy. Agilulf died in 616 AD, and Theodolinda dedicated the last years of her life to the constructions of several basilicas in Lombardy, including the beautiful cathedral of Monza, north of Milan. Inside the cathedral is kept the iron crown of the Longobards, so-called because it contains a half-inch band of iron obtained out of a nail used at the crucifixions of Christ. The iron crown symbolizes the medieval kingdoms of Italy, for it was used, it was used in the coronation of successive medieval kings of Italy. Another important name among the Longobard kings was Rotary. Just as Emperor Justinian is remembered due to the Justinian court of law, Rotary issued in 643 AD, he issued something equivalent, actually called an edict, the Edict of Rotary. It is interesting, for it contains a very detailed list of crimes and related punishments. But gradually the Longobards abandoned Arianism and became Catholic, more out of political convenience than, than otherwise. As an ethnic group, they were very superstitious. They believed in witches, which helped create the legends, the legend of the witches of Benevento, as we saw in the last episode, and also adored vipers. They liked to be blessed frequently, and this is probably why fonts, fonts with holy water began to appear frequently in the churches. In the Longobard parts of Italy, 
trade was conducted in the proximity of churches. Wealth was concentrated in the hands of abbots and arimans. Arimans were arimans were warriors that depended directly from the king. Monasteries and castles were the largest economic centers for the cities had been ravaged and impoverished by the constant invasions of various strains of barbarians. Of the last three Longobard kings, one was profoundly anti-Semitic, another was very stingy. The, he received ambassadors dressed in rags to show that he was poor, poor enough and could not offer any help should they ask for it. The last of the three, Liutprand, tried to conquer Rome, but the Pope went to meet him, just as Pope Leo had previously done with Attila the Hun, and Liutprand desisted from the, his intent. He then gave the Pope, as a personal gift, the small town of Sutri, and some historians have seen in this act, in this gift, the birth of the independent state of the Church that ended only 1200 years later, in 1870. Before we get to the next conquerors of Italy, the Franks, I will touch on another historical phenomenon that interested both Italy and the Empire, and I refer to the growing numbers of religious heresies. We saw earlier that with the pragmatic sanction, Emperor Justinian had delegated to the Catholic bishops the administrative powers earlier exercised by the, by the Roman prefects. In practice, the Church had acquired the functions of a state. At birth, the Christian Church was composed of independent cells, and heading every cell was a presbyter, a Greek word still used in the Orthodox Church, meaning the most mature of the cell. He was chosen by the faithful themselves. Then, in the fourth century, there appeared the first bishops, archbishops. Finally, in five cities, Rome, Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem, and, and Alexandria, they were installed a primate, a, a primate, a manager of bishops. To discuss issues of religious interpretation, the bishops would convoke a general council called ecumenical, another Greek word meaning inhabited land, therefore a council of all lands inhabited by the Christians. The decisions taken in ecumenical council were universal, that is, apply to everyone. And the word Catholic, meaning universal, derives from the deliberation of an ecumenical council which applied to, to apply to everyone. The confession, which was public until the 4th century, was made secret under Emperor Theodosius when a woman, in front of a sizable number of participants, confessed, confessed to have gone to bed with the deacon who was confessing her. The cult of images and the traffic in holy relics began also in the 4th century. The history that St. Peter, by founding the first church in Rome, intended to attribute a primacy to the Church of Rome arose in the 5th century. Until then, the Pope was one of the patriarchs. But during the councils of Chalcedon, or Chalcedon in 381 AD, the Pope was recognized with much opposition as primus inter pares, the first among equals, successor of Peter and head of the Roman Church. It was not easy to change an organization that initially was composed of individual independent units. And the first centrifugal tendency arose when the bishops became the heads of the presbyters, who were, as I said, the elected heads of each one of the cells. These rebellions or heresies had two characteristics, one theological, the other political, because, because we can see the rebirth of nationalism, and behind or below the interpretation of the scripture was this desire to rebel against a centralized power and claim independence for the local church governments. In the Orient, the church had become an instrument of the state. In the West, the church replaced the state. And this led to the birth of many heresies, some with curious names and beliefs. The phenomenon, the phenomenon if you like, is akin to what the communists called deviationism, which is common among centralized organizations at large. It's impossible to list all the heresies. Not worthy was, of course, the Arian heresy, which profoundly affected the history of Italy. Arius, 
was a 4th century preacher from Alexandria in Egypt who denied the divinity of Jesus Christ. And after unsuccessful attempts at reconciliation, Emperor Constantine called for an ecumenical council held at Nicaea or Nicaea, the Nicaean Council near Nicomedia in Turkey, where in the council only two out of the 300 attending bishops voted for Arius. Here in the picture St. Nicholas is showing slapping Arius. But unofficially many continued to support him. Among these was Bishop Eusebius, who was the teacher of Ulfila, whom we met earlier on and who was responsible of, for the Christianization at large of the barbarians, which is also why all barbarians were Arians. Another historically important heresy was due to Nestorius, who denied the virginity of Mary. He was exiled to an oasis in the Libyan desert, which did not deter his followers who, after Nestorius' death, migrated to Syria, where they translated into the local language both the Bible and the works of Aristotle. These translations became the foundation, or at least greatly influenced, the philosophy of the Muslim religion that later was to develop and bloom in the same region. Still, the problem of the nature of Christ continued to feed more heresies. For example, a monk called Eutike said that Christ had only had a divine nature. He was excommunicated by the Patriarch of Constantinople, but he did not give up. Another council was called, this time in Ephesus, in Ephesus, which voted in favor of Eutike, whereupon the Pope, Leo I, the same one who stopped Attila the Hun, all the things are interconnected, called for the Council of Chalcedon, or Chalcedon, which excommunicated Eutike. Still, the heresy did not die. It remained in Syria, Egypt, and even expanded in Armenia. Ecos oikos of the Monophysite religion, or heresy as it is called, remain in the Maronite Church, which we could call an independent branch of the Catholic Church. In Lebanon, back to the flow of events. The Goths first, and then the Longobards, effectively removed most of Italy from Byzantium's control. But the Byzantine Empire still maintained two strongholds. The Exarchate, a Greek word referring to the number six as in Exagon, that is, six cities or jurisdictions under the control of Byzantium. Heading the Exarchate was an Exarch residing in Ravenna. Rome was a sixth city, part of the Exarchate, but apart from the others because of the presence of the Pope, who, as we saw, had managed to be a special patriarch, or at least somewhat more important than the others. But the relation between the patriarchs of Rome and Byzantium deteriorated and were a destiny eventually to lead to the schism of 1054 AD. The first dramatic divisions occurred when Emperor Constant II issued an edict called the Typos or Typos in 648 AD. This edict prohibited any further dispute, arguments, or interpretation of the Christian religion by anyone. What had been declared official and true up to that time should remain so on pain of sanctions, depositions, and confiscations. Historians attribute this decision to the impending and the real threat coming from the Arabic Muslim invasions, which we will treat in another episode. Martin I, the Pope in Rome, bitterly complained and excommunicated the Patriarch of Byzantium, whereupon Emperor Constant II ordered the, the Exarch Olympius, the one in Ravenna, to travel to Rome from Ravenna and kill the Pope. Olympius tried to kill the Pope during the Mass, but he was suddenly blinded, or at least this is what is written in the histories of the Catholic Church. The next exarch tried again, and this time Pope Martin I was brought to Byzantium, where he was, where he was tried for being an asset, as we would say today, for being an asset of the enemies of Christ, and for his alleged little regard towards the Mother of Christ. He was condemned to death, though the sentence was commuted to life imprisonment. Martin I was old and ill and died much, not much later in 655 AD. He is one of the saints of the church. 
The next pope disregarded the, the typus edict, the edict of typus, or so called, whereupon Constant II in 663 AD traveled to Italy with an army. He landed in Taranto and tried to invade the Longobard Duchy of Benevento, but was defeated. Then he headed for Rome, which he wanted to reestablish as the capital of the Western Empire. This event, usually omitted in history books, was the last unsuccessful effort to bring back Italy under the banner of the Byzantine Empire. The next Byzantine Emperor, Leo III, added to the Typos or Typos Edict, which turned out not very successful, and he added in 1726 AD another edict against the cult of sacred images or called iconoclasm. Perhaps, perhaps he felt the influence of Islam, which as you know prohibits the use of images, or maybe the proliferation of images as re had reached the level of a scandalous trade. But images were a kind of advertising, tools of persuasion. All the people to be converted were in the overwhelming majority analphabet. Therefore, they reacted better to images than words, naturally so. For Leo III, the cult of images was also an element of instability, and he was not really wrong. We can see today how images are extensively used not only to sell, but also to corrupt the culture at large. Better not to expand on this, knowing who owns and controls Hollywood and the pornographic industry. The reaction to the iconoclastic edict was mixed. The elite of the clergy approved, the lower clergy and the monks rebelled, and the, the people were horrified. In Italy, Pope Gregory convoked a council that excommunicated the emperor and exempted the Romans from paying taxes to the empire. One more step, this was, toward the schism that would occur 300 years later. Back to the main story. We talked about the Goths, we talked about the Longobards, and now it's time for the Franks, who, based on current geographical alignments, were actually Germans, originally from the lower part of the River Rhine. In the fourth century, they had formed a confederation of tribes that often fought against each other. Eventually, they moved toward the northern part of what was then called Gallia, made famous in history and literature by Julius Caesar himself, who conquered it and wrote about it in his famous De Bello Gallico, the Gallian War. Anyway, when the Franks moved, moved in, they gave it another name, and thanks to them, meaning the Franks, I mean, from then on, it was called France. In 481 AD, one of the Franks, or we could say the French tribes, elected King Clodovius, the last heir of a dynastic royal family called the Merovingians. Clodovius converted to Christianity, and on Christmas Day of 496 AD, he was baptized in the Basilica of Reims, later converted into a magnificent Gothic cathedral where all the French kings were crowned ever since, until, that is, Louis XVI, who was later executed in 1792 during the French Revolution. In 613 AD, the grandson of Clodovius succeeded in expanding the French territory to approximately what it is today. Three times the Franks invaded northern Italy, but were expelled by the Longobards. Eventually, in the 6th century, Longobards and Franks made a peace agreement that lasted for 150 years. Not bad, considering how quickly international agreements can be broken even today. And when the region <coughs> of Provence, or Provence, as they call it in France, was threatened by the Arabs, the Merovingians called the Longobards for help. The Longobard king Liutprand, whom we met earlier in this episode, crossed the Maritime Alps, defeated and repelled the Muslims. Now, something peculiar happened to the bloodline of the Merovingian kings. They kept their title, but rather than reigning as kings do, they transferred all power to their prime minister, or as they were called, masters of the palace. And this became so bad that the last Merovingian kings were called the Lofer King or the Deadbed Kings, 
In 622 AD, the Merovingian Lofer King Dagobert appointed as Prime Minister Pepid, a member of a wealthy family, ambitious and courageous. With him and after him, the position of master of the palace became hereditary. Therefore, the Merovingians give way to the Pepinids, the Pepinids. One of them was Karl Martel. When the midwife showed the infant to his father, the father said, he is a male, I will call him Karl, which in the language of the time meant male. The name of Karl Martel and of his family of masters of the palace is linked to his victory over the Muslims at Poitiers in 732 AD. If the Franks had been defeated, today Europe would speak Arabic, it would read the Quran, and its inhabitants would probably have at least two wives. But given the relentless migration, it may still end up that way for Europe. Karl Martel was religious, but he was not a bigot. He prosecuted those who did not want to convert to Christianity, but ordered that the tithes that were paid to the church were now to be paid to the state. The church understandably did not approve the measure. An archbishop named Hinkmar reports that during a fact-finding trip by Saint Eucarius in the afterworld, the saint, the saint found Carmartel burning in eternity due to his prevarication when he was alive. The prevarication consisted, of course, in confiscating in favor of the state the properties of those who had left them to the church. Karl Martel had two sons, and they split France among them. They were still masters of the palace, that is, they weren't kings. But eventually, one of the brothers decided to become a monk in Monte Cassino, and the other was called Pepin the Short, who Pepin the Short, that is, finally decided to apply to the Pope and ask to recognize the situation, meaning that the master of the palace was in effect now the king. Cleverly, he posed the question to the Pope, is he king who has the title but not the power, or is he who has the power but not the title? And Pope Zachary replied, king is he who rules. Shortly later, Pepin, or Pepin was crowned as king of the Franks by a French bishop. And the last of the Merovingian kings, Childeric III, had his hair shorn and was confined into a convent. In the last minutes of this episode, we will see how the Franks took the place of the Longobards in Italy and the key role of the papacy in all these related developments. The issue of iconoclasm had deepened the conflict between Rome and Byzantium. In, in, excuse me, in 768 AD, in Rome, was elected Pope Sylvester III. In the same year, Pepin the Short died of malaria, leaving the throne to his sons, Charlemagne and Carloman, and divided the realm between the two sons. Particularly important was the influence of the Queen Mother Bertrade. She traveled to Pavia to meet with the Longobard King Desiderius, and while there she arranged two important marriages, that of Charlemagne with Desiderius' daughter Ermengarde, and that of her daughter Gisela with Adelchi, who was the firstborn of the Longobard King. To marry Ermengarde, Charlemagne had to repudiate his first wife, but later also he repudiated Ermengarde. In 771 AD, Carloman, the other brother, died in mysterious circumstances, and two months later, Pope Stephen, Stephen II also died. The new pope was Hadrian I, who was an enemy of the Longobards. Relations had become tense between Rome and Pavia. Meanwhile, Charlemagne's repudiation of Ermengarde, the daughter of the Longobard king, had understandably soured relations. Meantime, Charlemagne had annexed the lands of his dead brother Carloman, whose widow had crossed the Alps and sought refuge in Pavia with the Longobards. At this point, Desiderius decided to move against Rome. He occupied the Pentapolis on his march south and alarmed the Pope called on Charlemagne for help. Charlemagne the Frank asked Desiderius the Longobard to return to the Pope the lands that he, Desiderius, had recently conquered in exchange for gold and silver. But Desiderius refused. 
Charlemagne then mobilized the French army into two sections, one who crossed the Alps at the pass of Montsenis or Montgenisio, and the other section headed by his uncle Bernard, who crossed Italy at the pass of the Grand San Bernard. The army of Charlemagne could not get past Susa in Italy, but Bernard did better and defeated the Longobard army led by Desiderius' son Adelchi. Elected, or rather elated, by the victory, the Franks reached the besieged Pavia. The siege lasted eight months. Eventually, the city capitulated in 774 AD. Desiderius, his wife Ansa, and one of the daughters were imprisoned, and he ended his life in the convent of Corby in Picardy in France. And this was the end of Longobard Italy. It is difficult to say if it was good or bad for Italy, the, the Longobards. As a whole, the Longobards had been more uncomfortable occupiers, for they considered Italy an occupied territory, but gradually they had assimilated themselves, just like the Goths had done before. Perhaps the Longobards could have transformed Italy into a nation, as the Franks were doing with France. But the Franks did not have a pope. Italy did. And as Machiavelli, the Renaissance philosopher of power, famously said, the Pope was never strong enough to unite Italy, but was always strong enough to keep it divided. Many names, places, dates, and battles in this episode. My intent was to show that the first millennium was just a fill as filled with turbulent characters, wars, treachery, and murder as any other, because man, after all, is little more than an instrument in an orchestra directed by the muse of history. Thank you for watching. Until next time, I am Jimmy Moldia for Historical Sketches. Good night. Mm -hmm.